Hello and welcome, or as Bishop Barron has, <laughs> peace be with you. Uh, there's no reason why not to emulate somebody as effective as Bishop Barron. The readings I'm going to use are for the last two weeks run together. They're very powerful and in fact they're completely shocking. And they are supposed to shock us to the point where we realise we can't treat Jesus as if he was an ordinary person or in any way. We can't treat him as an inspired person, we can't even treat him as a prophet because he shocks us. So let me go to the Gospel of Matthew and let us allow ourselves to be shocked. I'm going to go slightly further back than the lectionary readings because we need the first verse, Matthew 34. Don't think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come set a man against his father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her father and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. As a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow it is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The passage then goes on to talk about Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he's my disciple will by no means lose his reward. I want to link that to Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats passage. And did you visit me when I was naked and hungry and so on? Why is this passage so important? Because it's so completely outrageous. It ought to warn everybody that Jesus is utterly in a category of his own. You can't compare him to Buddha or Muhammad or Moses, or any other figure, because frankly, if anybody said these things to us and it wasn't to Jesus, we would have nothing to do with them. The level of egocentricity, of self-referentialism, of what word we use so often nowadays, narcissism, is so intense, it would be repulsive, completely repulsive. And yet, why isn't it? Why, why do we forget, or what does it mean when Jesus says, He's not come to bring peace. Surely he's the Prince of Peace. Christians don't have swords. What on earth can this mean? Well, everything, of course, has to be set in its context. So what Jesus is talking about here is not turning Christianity into a, an, a, into a, a military operation in a way that Muhammad did. As always, he's talking spiritually. It's quite difficult sometimes to retune ourselves to the way in which Jesus talks spiritually. When he talks about the poor, he means the spiritual poor. When he talks about children, he doesn't mean people under the age of consent or under the age of adolescence. He means spiritual children. We have to attune ourselves to the way he speaks because he's speaking to us. It's his language we're trying to understand. And only as we speak, we learn to speak Jesus' language, Christianity, can we begin to understand what he means? So if he's come to set families against each other, and then he says these dreadful, really shocking and horrible words about loving him more than we love our parents and not preferring our children to him, there has to be something profound in there that we haven't seen in order for this not to be hate speech of some kind. I was sitting in Mass this morning looking at a very moving crucifix of Jesus on a wall of a Normandy church. And there is the figure of this man hanging in the air. It's both beautiful and alarming at the same time. The reason I like to look at it is because I think probably my, my, my deepest problem <laughs> has to do with guilt. This is not a kind of psychotherapeutic issue. It's to do with the once once one has glimpsed the holiness of God, you know that, that most wonderful and amazing vision in Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up with his throne, uh, in, on his throne in the temple with the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim crying, holy, and, I, and, and Isaiah collapses and says, woe to me for I'm a man of unclean lips. The moment we get any kind of taste, sense, smell, feeling of who God really is, 
the gap between us morally becomes one that is unable to be born. And here is the difficulty of, of being a child of God, made in the image of God. We long, pardon the clocks are going again, we long desperately for his love, for he made us, he made us a love. He made us hungry for love. He made us famished for love. But yet we can't approach him because of our, our flaw, of the flaws in us. And here is the dreadful condition of humanity, to be famished for love but unable to approach because of the nuclear holiness and purity, too impure. It's almost as if we came to a, a pool we wanted to drink from, but our lips were so blistered that the pain of putting our lips to the water meant that we couldn't drink. Only one thing can overcome this contradiction, and it is if Jesus takes away our flaws, our sin, this weight of, of moral turpitude that has stained our souls. It hasn't stained us so much, though some people's faces show the stain. <laughs> but it's a bit like Oscar Wilde's wonderful conceit of the, of the portrait in the attic, where, which stands, of course, for the soul, where it slowly becomes corrupt in a way the body doesn't. Our souls are portraits in the attic, and they have become corrupt, and only Jesus can heal them. And so here is Jesus saying, you have the most serious problem, that if you, if you attend to love uh, on a normal human level, then you will lose the creator of love, you will lose the source of love. There's a dichotomy, essentially, between the love of God and the love of humanity. We often flatter ourselves that the way we love each other is is, uh, is is an element of God's love for us. And St. John, in one of his lessons, says something similar to that, uh, whoever loves is in God. But John means something very specific. It's a kind of haiku piece of, of uh, scripture. It's, it's profoundly intense and needs unpacking. But let's go back to Jesus here, because what Jesus is telling us is that he has come to save our souls. He's borne the price of our disobedience and our independence and because of that our soul can be rescued if i look at my parents i'm extremely grateful to them uh, they've done they did so much for me they, they I, I i can't even begin to to believe to understand what my my mother went through giving birth to me i was actually quite a difficult birth and i'm afraid i was a difficult child uh, and i tried my father's patience endlessly and if i think of my children whom I love beyond measure. How is it possible to love God more than my children? And yet, my love of my parents and my love of my children is entirely derivative. It's not the source. It's somewhere down river from the source. Up river, the source is God himself. And I have to be able to love my children as a response, as the effect of love with God. God's love has to come first. I have to prefer loving God to loving my children because if I get it the wrong way around and love my parents or my children or anybody else for that matter more than I love God, then God becomes inaccessible to me. I've got it the wrong way around. And here is Jesus saying he has to be the most important person to each of us because he died for our sins. He has the greatest command on all our affection. And the astonishing thing is if we allow ourselves to love him most, to be grateful to him most, to be dependent upon him most, then the love for the parents and the children and, and the special other, they, they, they get put in their right place. They flow. They are properly derivative instead of competitive. But this is very hard to understand because it involves a placing of the spirit or the soul before our ordinary life. And it is very difficult for anyone in the 21st century. We are so bound up in time and space that it's very difficult to give some thought to our souls and, and how important they are. Now, if, if Jesus was not the Son of God, who had not died to carry our sins, then what he says would be simply 
so appalling we would have to reject him immediately and so but this is a Jesus that people don't often really deal with so often parts of the gospel we have an image of Jesus that we, we hang on to and prefer and if you don't read all the way through the gospel regularly it's easy to make Jesus in our own image and you get the feeling sometimes <clears throat> particularly with clergy who you think are not born again but just doing religion that they don't read the gospels very thoroughly or indeed very often and they wouldn't know what to do with a passage like this because it's entirely different from their Jesus. I'm thinking, for example, at the moment of the latest document to come out of the Catholic synodal process, the uh, Instrumentum Laboris, where the authors talk about the unity of the whole of humanity in a very casual way, a sort of new world order way, a new age way, nothing to do with the vision that Jesus gives us here where there is no unity in humanity. In fact, what Jesus calls for is a division in humanity. He comes to divide us in order to reorientate our relationships. If we love humanity more than we love Jesus, we are not worthy of him. We are not to love humanity in that sense. We are, in fact, intended to allow ourselves to be divided from each other so that everything can be put back in the right order. There must be a division in the family so that God can be reorientated to become first. There must be a division in the way we look at the rest of the world in order that we put God first and that we don't worship some kind of collective togetherness of humanity, which is so often the trademark of liberal Christianity and, and liberal religion. So in these very powerful and shocking words, warning us that he was bringing a sword in order to cut ties that keep us from him and tie ourselves to each other in ways that are problematic for us, in order to bring a war, a conflict between light and darkness, between priorities that have taken us over and need to be reorientated. By saying these things, Jesus intends to shock us. The shock is so profound, it's hard enough to pick up our cross and to follow him. It's hard enough to begin to choose a way of self-denial at all, but then to be told that if we don't do it, we're not worthy of him, is, is, is good or might be deeply, deeply debilitating and, and disturbing, except that that's the path of love. That's how he came to us. That's what he did to make his way to us. And, and it's only by going in that way with him that we can accompany him. Some of the other passages in this part of Matthew are really very difficult indeed. In Matthew 25, it's always been understood that if you clothe the naked, you feed the hungry, you look after the homeless, you visit those in hospital or in prison, that insofar as you did it to these, at least of these, my brethren, you're doing it to Jesus. And it becomes a kind of manifesto for social work. It's taken me a very long time to be completely confident of this, but that just isn't true. It applies. The least of these, my brethren, are Christians. They're disciples. And this passage in Matthew makes it very clear to that. Insofar as you brought a cup of water, insofar as, and, and whoever gives one of these little ones, we're back again, little ones spiritually, he's followers, not a child, a cup of water, because he is a disciple, I say to you truly, he will by no means lose his reward. We do it because we do it to Jesus. And then the following gospel, the one that comes up for today's readings, we find our, our Lord saying how grateful he is that the Father has only shown these things to the children and not to the wise. Well, once again, we're in the language of the Spirit. We're talking soul language here. Jesus doesn't mean young people. <clears throat> Each of us, I think, has, um, has, has aspects of our personality that remain young and at the same time as being old and what Jesus is doing is he's appealing to the humility in us he's appealing to that part of us that knows we don't have the answers that knows we don't have the strength in ourselves that knows we don't have the intelligence there's part of me that is always stressed by the fact that, that I'm not clever enough to understand the things I want to understand that I'm not humble enough to put up without complaining the things that really do put me in my place uh, that I'm not I'm not 
determined enough to put up with pain in the way I should be to follow Jesus. And, and any attempts to pretend that I'm a grown up, I can manage these things in my own strength, must falter in the face of the real experience of following Jesus where, in fact, I and you fall flat on our faces time after time after time again. The number of people I talk to in the, the kind of context, not of spiritual direction so much, but of spiritual friendship, where it's very easy to allow our, our ego, even our super ego, the, that part of us that, that has high and strict standards to really beat us up over the number of times that we fail. But I'm always immensely encouraged by that conversation between Jesus and Peter, where Peter says, Lord, how many times have I got to forgive my enemy? Seven, seven times seven, the perfect number without end, effectively. Now, if that's what God calls us to, it's only because he's willing to forgive us without end. However many times we fail. Now, of course, if our attitude became one of, well, it doesn't matter if I fail because I'll get forgiven, that destroys the whole thing. It's not it at all. But if we try our best to follow God and inevitably fail and then say to him, Lord, will you have mercy upon me? His answer is always yes. This is why the Mass is such a wonderful place to be. As we go into Mass, the first thing that we do is we say, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. We have fallen flat on our face yet again. And here we are to receive the food of immortality only because you have mercy upon us as we look up at the figure crucified upon the cross. But this requires being a child, intellectually, spiritually, morally, everything but physically. But we have to learn Jesus speak. We have to learn the language of the Gospels and it's very different and the problem is that the church particularly the church of the last century has so often lost its sense of the holiness of God and the vividness of the spiritual life the reality of the soul that it's begun to slip into a kind of political and material dimension it's a very very difficult thing to do to keep the balance between soul and spirit uh, sorry between soul and body between spirit and mind is enormously difficult but unfortunately particularly in the well perhaps it's to do with the fact that we live in a very secular and very materialistic age where the idea of a soul is so counterintuitive to people uh, brought up in a secular society that only some form of spiritual illumination can make it clear to us but we have to bring the church back to talking about the salvation of souls. We are not here to create world peace. Jesus didn't came to bring peace. He came to bring a sword to divide relationships so they could be reconstituted. Jesus has not come to bring us joy in the sense of, of that joy is the thing that we aim for. Though we find ourselves with the most profound joy when we are in him. Once again, it's a consequence it's not a goal. How can the church keep these priorities? Well, only by praying. I think probably it's only, it's only by persisting in prayer that the elusiveness of God <laughs> brings us back to our knees and makes us realize we are children, simply holding out our empty hands, saying, Abba, feed me. Give me the, the epusios bread, the supernatural bread of your body for this day. Let's allow ourselves to be shocked by Jesus out of a material life, out of our intellectual stability, out of our self-sufficiency. Let's allow the reality of the God who loves us more than we can ever imagine to constantly reconfigure who we are, who our priorities are, how, what our priorities are, how we love him, how we love one another and how we love ourselves. Let us attempt to be worthy of Jesus by putting him first for he carried all our sins on the cross so that we can stand in the presence of God and not be driven away by the burden of our own ineptitude and rebellion. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen.